nobody in Hollywood would ever dream of making a movie based on his life because nobody would believe it. The Detroit News one day said, of all the great athletes in the world, who do you think was the greatest athlete in your mind? And I said, well, the greatest athlete in the world, as far as I'm concerned, is Hashim Khan. He said, Hashim who? Who's that? He was the first true legend of the game, I believe. If there's a name synonymous with squash, it has to be Khan, J-H-A-N. He brought the World Championship to Pakistan and put Pakistan on the map. Hashim Khan, the Pashtun or Patan as I always call them, very, very tough people. A very strong, historically warrior race. And to still be able to play at, at 90 is so extraordinary. He's like Yoda, like you ever seen Star Wars where Yoda sort of like hobbles out and then gets in the big lightsaber scene? That's my grandfather. Somebody who came from nothing and got everything. He's the American dream, you know, but it's he's sort of more of the Pakistani, British, American dream. He had this incredible talent, an incredible hunger, but most of all, he intuitively knew how to capitalize on that, how to translate all this unique personality and unique ability into what became the first celebrity of squash. From where Hashim came from and who he was, it changed who played squash the standard of the play. It just changed the potential for the growth of the game in lots of different countries and lots of different people getting the opportunity to play the game. It stems from what Ashim achieved. Keep eye and ball, you will control the game. You will follow the ball in time. You will be in right place, right time if you watch that ball. Hashem is famous for saying, keep eye on ball. Everybody thought, oh, keep eye on ball. That means, you know, watch the ball while you hit it, which is what everybody always tells you to do in every ball sport. But it was watching it when the other player was hitting the ball. And that's what made Hashem such an incredibly fast player. He knew where the ball was going. He could anticipate because he was watching it at all times. Think in time, move in time, sing in time, hit in time, think before you hit. His knowledge of squash was so complex. His ability, but at the same time, his ability to articulate in English was very simple. No time to stop, ready to go. Hashem's English might not have been that good, but he was extremely shrewd and smart. He really knew how to capitalize on his celebrity and make a great living for him and his family. At first glance, Squash looks like most other racket sports. But new players quickly learn that there are some important differences that make squash unique. The serve, of course, has to hit the front wall, has to be above the red line. After that, once the ball's in play, you can either hit it in the air or after one bounce, but when you hit it at some point, it must hit that front wall. The most agonizing sound a squash player can hear is this. That's the sound of the ball hitting the tin. The tin is that 17-inch strip of metal which runs the width of the court. I get it. No, I blew it. I remember when Hashem and I were getting pretty close. I said, Hashem, what's wrong with my game? Why can't I become a A player? He says, you got weak backhand. I says, well, how do I improve that? He says. You give me $5 and I give you secrets. I gave him $5. I said, that's beautiful to become a good player. I said, OK, what is the secret now, Hashem? He says, don't hit 10. <laughs> I said, don't hit 10. I said, everybody knows that. He said, then why you hit 10? <laughs> that's, that's the expression that he, uh, he said it in that way. You won it three times the World Open. Uh, no, I win seven times. Seven times? Seven times yes. British Open, <laughs> Scottish Open, eight times, and uh, other, every championship, like British professional that time, the Dunlop professional, I win many times. If I do half, must, if I do half, I'll be happy. You must have been very fit, <laughs> because your first title at 34 years old? I was 37. 37? Uh, first time. And That's the great. last time, in 44-year age, I win the British Open. 44. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, one of his favorite tricks was taking the racket and putting it upside down, you know, the, the 
handle coming up on the tin, you'd stand at the back of the court. If you hit that ball right, you can hit between racket and wall, it's no problem. It's look difficult, but it's not difficult. If you just hit that ball right, He's written a fantastic book, The Khan Game, Squash the Khan Game. Uh, that's sort of the Bible to many, many squash players all over the world. It's simplified, and you know, it may not even be updated, but he just put a whole new spin on the thing. The game of squash is, has a very interesting, uh, if somewhat checkered, history. Going back to around about 1800, um, the River Thames uh, at London had prisons, debtors' prisons which uh, was incidentally the prison for the affluent criminals. And since they could not be weaned away from their record sport, uh, just like the afternoon tea and crumpets, they had to improvise. So they tended to hit a ball against the wall in the prison. First of all, it would be one wall, and then they tried two walls and so on. So that's how the game of rackets evolved. In the 19th century, it was a very common game to play next to a saloon or a tavern. So after work, you'd go and have a beer and you'd play rackets. We now come through to about 1850-ish, and rackets by then had been established, and mainly in public schools. It actually was invented at a, at a prep school, at what's called a public school outside of London. And at the public school in Harrow, just northwest of London, the boys, as all boys, don't just sort of sit down outside a court waiting to play. While they were waiting to play rackets, they used to hit the ball up and down in the courtyard outside. So this is the area which they called the corner. And uh, I suppose this could be described as one of the original, one of the original squash courts. One of the interesting things about these games is that in those days they actually preferred an area which had some hazards. So there you've got a windowsill and a drain pipe, and this enabled you to, to hit the ball, and uh, of course the bounce was completely unpredictable after that, and they preferred that to, to, to a, a simple court where the ball would bounce back straight at you. Shall we go? Here we are. Now the racket's ball is a bit more like a golf ball. It was very hard. So not only did it make an awful lot of noise in the courtyard, but of course they broke windows. Squash was basically playing rackets in a very small area. So it was way too fast for the young little boys, the sort of, you know, seventh graders of these prep schools. So they shortened up the racket and they used a different kind of ball. Instead of using a hard, unsqueezable ball. They used uh, an India rubber ball, a rubber ball. Rubber had just been invented, and they used a rubber ball that was a lot slower and easier for these young boys to control. And when it hit the wall, it made a squash, swashing noise, hence the word squash rackets. And of course, the evolution of the game developed after that. It spread through the country clubs and the city clubs in, in London into the sort of upper class of England. But it was a game that was an elitist game. It was, it, they enjoyed it. They didn't want it to be a mass popular game. It was really a game for, uh, for gentlemen of leisure and for people who were born into the, into the right society. It was a comfortable little world and it was around privilege, whether it was in those clubs, whether it was in upper class, uh, medium, um, in the forces, amongst the officers, not amongst the men in the services. Squash came from, you know, much more of uh, an elite background, and yet Hashim Khan became the ultimate champion from the humblest of beginnings. I was born in Pakistan, Peshawar. I grew in Peshawar. I still love my country and my home. The area where he came from is really, really poor. We've come from a very, very small village in Peshawar, which is a, a part of Pakistan, which is just on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the northwest frontier. And of course, it's just like the Wild West up there. That area there are the mountain people. Uh, and that's why they're even tougher than they, they should be. 
There was this extra hunger, this extra force. Dad, you know, came from a real tough environment. And you have to understand that, you know, the environment really shapes a person. And uh, the old ways, the old fashioned ways, as they say, the old country, you know, the, you know, they were with him. You know, he couldn't shed those. Yeah, in Pakistan, like where my grandpa was from, the Northwest, you know, Peshawar, all that, like, it's all tribal, like, re you know, everywhere. It's all about respect and, like, you know, the fight, you know. He was determined to do something, and he did it. You know, it's amazing if you think about where Hashim's actually from. He's from Pakistan, but he's from this one part that the national government isn't allowed to go into. And there's no other country in the world that has a province where the federal government has no power. And that says something about the Pashtun energy and the fierceness of these people. And that's where Hashim's from. We come from tribe Pashtun in our, in, or Pukhtun in our language, which, which means Bataan. But they're Bataans. They're... Afghans, really. Uh, they're, they're, they're more Afghan than Pakistani. They're tribesmen. The rugged life in the northwest frontier province has made the Patans somewhat heavier in build and tougher than their neighbors to the south. And they are regarded as one of the sturdiest peoples alive today. The Patans are just great people. They're warriors. They're strong. Brave as lions, eagle eyesight. Their eyesight is phenomenal. The quick reactions are phenomenal. You hear stories of the Kuiper Pass or someone lights a cigarette and someone's got him before he's lit the cigarette. This is a, a warrior people, mountain people, fantastic genetics. And we see that on the squash court. We are modern day gladiators. No one had a better eye for the ball than Hashem. Uh, he was like an eagle out there, uh, going after a squash ball like uh, prey. He was motivated and, and very focused. Incredible inner determination. His own background, his up upbringing, and the Pashtun culture had a lot to do with that. Religion has been a bigger and bigger part of his life. You know, the Muslim faith teaches you discipline, obedience, focus, the Ramadan, which is fasting for a month. It takes a lot of determination and stuff. And so in a, in a funny way, it's not different from the regime of squash. Not only squash game, they do anything they don't want to lose. Fight or sports or anything, they don't want to lose anything. The main thing for the Pashtuns is to live with honor. If you respect a Pashtun, so he will give double respect in response. If you insult a Pashtun, so then uh, he is uh, he's a best friend <laughs> and, and, and the worst enemy also. The best friend and the worst enemy. I've always been in love with the Pashtuns because of their history of what they have gone through. There are so many invaders that have gone through there, but they're still kept to their traditions, and they've always been as individuals, always been fighters. One reason why the invaders came through Peshawar is this location. It is located on the crossroads of Asia. I mean, the Silk Route uh, passed through it, so that all the caravans and the trade uh, bound for India and China uh, passed through. For thousands of years, even before the time of Alexander the Great, the Khyber Pass has been the traditional gateway to the subcontinent. This ancient route of the invader leads to the border of the free nation of Pakistan. And of course, the long string of people who came to invade and to conquer and to rule, uh, the lost ones were the British. When the British came to India, whenever they will uh, capture and occupy a particular part of the country, uh, they would build a new city close by, within a few miles of the old city, and they called them cantonment. And these cantonments were the garrison towns where they housed all the troops. 
This was a little slice of Britannica surrounded by the chaos of the Indian countryside. These Pathans, they, for the last part, they would have nothing to do with the British, but probably because of, for economic reasons, they said, well, we'll go down to the plains and, and, and work. And mainly they were doing menial jobs like gardeners and houseboys and cooks and that sort of thing. Typical of the British Army all over the world, wherever they go, they would bring the game of squash as something for them to do when they weren't on duty. And so that's how the game got all the way into this very obscure part of India. And they had a small club that had a couple squash courts, a rackets court, and a bar. It was very rudimentary. It wasn't a country club. It wasn't something glamorous. And Hushing's dad was called a steward, dining room steward, but he would be sort of maitre d', you know. Before he got that job, is a head steward called Butler. Before that, long time before that, I never see him play, but I heard he was a good, strong man. He was play good tennis, but I was too young when he died. Hashim used to go with his dad to the club as a little boy of eight or nine. And he used to, well, all little boys, they liked to to watch ball games played. So he used to sit on the back wall, and uh, there were just four walls. Basically, he became like a ball boy, where if the ball would go over the squash court um, wall, it used to be open squash courts in those days in India, Pakistan, he would go fetch it. I used to sit top of the wall, and if his ball go out, I called another boy to get that ball. But any time court open, I come down to a very place squash. And these courts were very different from courts today. They were open air, concrete, and because this was Pakistan, it's quite hot in the summer, and the club where the courts were were only used sort of early in the morning and late in the afternoon, early evening. He loved the sport, so he played as much chance as he could. I loved that game from that age. Therefore, I quit from his school in fourth grade. <laughs> just play squash. I think he just had a natural attraction to the game. You know, he, he, he would sneak on the court with, you know, barefooted and broken rack and broken ball. And, you know, whether it was in the hottest point of the day to getting out there under the full moonlight. He would take the racket and the ball and he would play squash by himself for two or three, four hours. And this was the great training device that he didn't know was the right way to do it. But he became so good in large part because he would play himself. And he'd run back and forth, playing a long rally. And of course, this made him work very hard. And it, this is what he called Hashem versus Hashem. And nobody teach me, just watch good player and uh, try to make copy. I used to play side wall, front wall, and run, and hit the ball back to the back wall, and return in one bounce from here, and then go with the ball, side wall, front wall. That was for my condition. And then the local environment, like a Pathan, stamina, barefooted, on climbing the rocks, coming down the rocks, playing with the stone, playing in the heat, playing in the sun, no AC, no TV, no fans, no deep freezer, no fridge, just sleeping on the floor, probably a fan is there or not, drinking the hot water, whatever way it came, eating the chapati, no vitamins and all these, you know, these sort of diets today. It was just a thirsty commitment. Just like the game and like to play every day, all day. Just play squash. He slowly worked his way up at the officer's club, starting off as a ball boy and then becoming an assistant professional and eventually becoming a full professional. So in his mid-20s, he was able to scratch out enough of a uh, living to be able to start a family. I never met my wife before the marriage, 
there was a range. My parents and her parents. And I see her face after the marriage first time. <laughs> when I was growing up in Pakistan, uh, my family lived in a very modest house. My father had a modest job as a squash pro. A squash professional uh, or a tennis professional was considered menial, you know. They couldn't come into the clubhouse or something. They just kept to the squash courts. They couldn't use any of the facilities. They were treated like servants. Squash professional was considered a dirty word. You had to come through the back door. But because they were good, they, they shown some sort of respect by the members. I liked him because he, he was so uh, friendly. He was so accommodating all the time that one enjoyed playing with him. I'm sure that Hashim was the uh, ultimate club pro because he has this ability to relate to everybody and, and I'm sure on the court he was giving them what's called a customer's game. It would be uh, a game that would be just right for the, the customer. Uh, if they were playing a game, uh, the Hashim would win by a couple of points at the end, but uh, there would be a lot of a drama in between, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, smiles and, and a bit of instruction mixed in. I mean, it's incredible that these officers, you know, drinking their gin and tonics on the veranda, might have peered over into the open air court and seen Hashim Khan in the prime of his life playing, you know, an officer at the club. And there he was, going to be the greatest player ever. And nobody knew it outside of Basharwa. In his 18, 19, 20s, he was a, apparently a fantastic player. Um, but his real opportunity to, to show his talent on a world stage didn't come until he was in his 30s, believe it or not. Uh, when, and that's when most athletes have, are thinking of retiring. <laughs> he got uh, an offer to go to Bombay and to play in the All India Championships. So I think it was in 1942, he traveled outside of Peshawar for the first time, goes down to India, uh, down to what's now India, goes to Bombay where they were playing the matches. And at that time, Abdul Bari was at that state unbeatable in India and in the subcontinent, and, uh, and nobody had heard of Hashim, by the way. In 45 and 46, he came to Bombay and beat Bari twice. So he had won the All Indian Championships three or four years, and then partition happens, and that's the end of the tournament. In 1947, Pakistan was the new country, separate from India. On August 14, 1947, a new nation was born. Pakistan took its place among the free governments of the world in the family of United Nations. India was given independence, and India was carved into a Muslim Pakistan and a predominantly Hindu India. We like that partition to Pakistan. Muslim people got own country, separate country. And that partition was good for us. Uh, but a lot of people get killed in that partition. Uh, Hindu kill Muslim and Muslim kill Hindu. Pakistan was created under very difficult circumstances. There was a tremendous chaos of killings and migration of populations uh, that took place at the time of 47, which nobody anticipated it. The great migration of people across the newly created border between India and Pakistan was primarily based on religion. Hindus and Sikhs felt no longer welcome in the place where they had lived for many, 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 many centuries. And consequently, many Muslims in India felt unsafe for living in India and so they crossed the border and a million people died. In 1949, India sent Abdul Bari to London for British Open. Abdul Bari was sponsored by his club, which was another club in Bombay, to, to go to the British Open, which was considered and is still considered the Wimbledon of squash. He got to the finals. Uh, he lost uh, in the finals to the reigning champion, Mahmoud al Karim of Egypt. Yet, being a finalist, he still went back home a hero. And so Pakistan, uh, very jealous of India's success, they said, well, if they can send their best player, we're going to send our best player. Who's our best player? And their best player in 1950 was Hashim Khan. 
So my father at his club started trying to lobby the members to say, look, my cousin is a great player. He did a wonderful thing, but I beat him more often than he beats me. Why don't you, uh, why don't you send me to England next year? He kept saying he's good enough to play the British Open and win the British Open. So they said, OK, you can beat him. You know, he says, yeah, you know, so he talked his way into it. And the next year, 1950, was his big break. By this time, of course, the Peshawar space was run by Pakistani officers and not British officers. Uh, they clubbed together and sent him over here because he said, I beat Barry, so I, I might do quite well in, in England. And that's what happened. If Hashem didn't have his incredible personality, all the talent in the world wouldn't have got him out of Basharwa. Because he had no money, he needed patrons, he needed supporters, he needed people who were going to be willing to pay for him to fly over to England and, and, to, and to play against the best in the world. Of course, he's never been on a plane before, he's never been overseas. Flying for Hashem in Basabid. Uh, well, uh, I think quite adventure in itself. Flying in a DC-3 at about 140, 50 miles an hour. Took you days to get to London. I was like London. That is a very peaceful, that place. Wonderful. When Hashim first came to England, he was called up by the representatives of Pakistan in England to take him under his wing. And Hashim always played barefoot. And they took him to this club and they wouldn't let him play barefoot in the club. So he had to go out and buy tennis shoes. That is the first time I used the shoes. And shoes can't run like a bearing feet. <laughs> <laughs> that is a real symbolic journey that he, he took as a pro at a small club, not getting any attention, and, and really playing a very crude version of the game to going to this very elitist, restrictive club, indoor court, and having to wear sneakers. That's a real journey that symbolizes how the game was developing, that somebody like him could come to that kind of club and be better than anybody there. Okay, can we look through the pages? You can show us what's going on here. Picture is the uh, Mahmoud Al Karim from Egypt. Before I come to London, he was the four-year British Open champion. Good. I asked to one of the British squash profession, "How is the Karim playing squash?" I never see him. How he's play? They told me, "Don't talk about Karim." I say, "Why?" He say, "When he's play shot." He's finished. Nobody in the world can return that. He goes up to Edinburgh to play in the Scottish Open. This is traditionally the warm-up for the British Open, the great tournament, the sort of Wimbledon of, of squash. So he's in Edinburgh. He gets to the finals of the Scottish Open. This is quite good. And he plays Mahmoud El Karim. Now, El Karim was the great player in the 1940s and 50s, the, 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 the great Egyptian stylist. He dominated the game in the late 40s, and at that time was considered absolutely unbeatable. And if I recall, my father beat him three state games. The first game was close, and then he beat him convincingly. Huge upset. Everybody just can't believe that this unknown player who nobody's ever heard of, nobody's ever heard of, beat the best player in the world in the Scottish Open finals. I never forget reading it at a, at a school at the time. They said, well, this rather interesting uh, squash player from Pakistan uh, clearly got the met better of the world champion, but the world champion seemed to be slightly unfit. The buzz was, well, this unknown squash player beat the reigning icon of squash, Mahmoud Karim, but it must have been a fluke because what the heck, it's only a warm-up tournament to the real thing. They go down to London to play the British Open. It's played at the Lansdowne Club, which is this very posh club in London. And they play on the Bruce Court, which is the famous exhibition court at the Lansdowne Club. And he makes it through the draw. Karim makes it through the draw. They meet in the finals. And the first game goes to five all. They're playing to nine points, and it's five all. The legend is that the rallies were monstrously long. We're talking about four or five minute rallies. Nobody knows what's going to happen and the stylish Egyptians hitting these nice balls. Matt Kareem was a finesse player, elegant, 
beautifully dressed. The pros over here at that time wore long trousers. Uh, Hashim turned up in shorts. The English particularly admired something that was aesthetically good, looked good, elegant, and Hashim was the very epitome of everything that they didn't recognize as being almost acceptable. British press started nicknamed him the butcher because he used to choke upon the racket like a butcher, like cutting a knife. He didn't have the style, he didn't quite have the elegant form, but he was effective because he just ran everything down. First, I not give him chance to play the shot. I keep him in the back corner, both sides. Second, if he's play shot, I was fast enough, I was in good shape, I can get everything. He was like an express train. One player said to me, you could smell the rubber burning off his shoes when he turned. He turned so quickly. I loved that. You could smell the rubber burning off his shoes. So anyways, the first five points are incredibly long rallies, and this Egyptian is just running from, you know, he hasn't come across somebody, <laughs> somebody like this. And Hashem starts to get to every ball that the Egyptian hits. El Karim cannot put the ball away. And Hashim wins the first game 9-5. The second game starts, Hashim wins the game 9-love. The third game, Hashim wins it 9-love. I beat him 9-5, nine 9 nut, 9 nut. He was the world champion. <laughs> he effectively destroyed Kareem's career in less than one game. Kareem then almost retired from the game. He just he couldn't cope. This is an incredible upset. The, the, the scale is, is as if somebody in, 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 in baseball won 20 to nothing. He absolutely obliterated the great player, the, the post-war champion, wiping him off the court. And suddenly, the world of squash changed overnight because this little bloke with short baggy trousers arrived from Peshawar or somewhere nobody had ever heard of and beat the great Muhammad Karim an elegant stroke player, three naught, bang. A legend had been created virtually overnight. After Hashim Khan's great victory, we are upper hand with the Britishers, you know. And it's a great moment for all sportsmen of Pakistan. You, know. you couldn't have possibly expect such a good start for a young country uh, in complete chaos and yet producing a world champion, getting into the top draw almost immediately. And I'm the one to pick in, in map Pakistan all over the world. In the world map, Pakistan come in the world map for, because it was for squash. Every newspaper headline, Pakistani squash player and so on. And he flies in and he becomes a national hero. He is their first national hero in 1951. He was garlanded with these flowers. Throughout the Peshawar city, he was taken a procession that he is the hero and he has won the match. <laughs> I was a little boy. <laughs> they, they were just parades and musics and all that, and they were throwing flowers at him. That was a great time for Pakistan, but particularly for the uh, Peshawar. Here was a native son who goes from the dusty little place to Great Britain and slay the dragons. And uh, that was just a wonderful feeling for all of us. You see, in any country, there are pillars which have brought respect to that country. Like Abraham Lincoln is for USA. Hashim Khan for a poor country, a newborn country, is one of the, one of the very strong pillars whose respect in the eyes of the people will never die. Respected by all. Whether they know squash, they play squash, or they don't play squash. It's kind of nice to travel with Dad because he's treated like a rock star there. <laughs> Somebody knows him there. Um, they they recognize him right away. Whether you're in the airport or a restaurant or in a store, 
I like traveling with him, honestly. Such an icon. I know <laughs> he's is, an icon. He he's, you know, and we don't realize that living with him, he's our dad. Mm -hmm. You look upon him like that, but we forget that he's a legend. And I'm surprised he's, that people still recognize him with his age and being up there. His features have changed since he was young, and a lot yeah. of them recognize him when he was young, but seeing him on TV there all the time, they, they recognize him right away. Hashim Sahib, how did you feel here? How did you feel here? What do you think about your own life? We are here. 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 So, when you play squash, you are winning. Today, you are not winning Pakistan. So, how do you feel about your new players? You should win. You should win. Because these people have a great facility today. और हुकूमत बहुत ख्याल करता है काफी पैसे खर्च करते हैं। This was a British game for the officers of that time. This was just an entertainment for those people, for those elites. When Hashim came, he took it as his career, and it was the question of his life and death, or you can say bread and butter for him. Hashim wasn't afraid to make money, and he was very shrewd about it. And he knew it from the very beginning that he could capitalize on his celebrity. Elmo is playing in all the world, uh, Middle East, Egypt. I play a lot of squash in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Afghanistan. No, nobody plays squash there. Pakistan, India. He traveled all over the world being what was really the first squash missionary. And he went to Australia and he won the Australian Open. And he went to Canada and he went to Scotland. And he sort of traveled around to all the different squash centers around the world, promoting the game and winning all their tournaments. Everybody wanted to uh, you know, meet the man, play with the man. Sometimes he would, uh, he, you know, I think in Australia, he was flown around by the Pakistani uh, Royal Air Force and he would play virtually everybody in town, uh, get on the plane, and then he'd uh, make his next stop, perhaps exhausted, but he knew uh, that this was uh, something which he should do as an ambassador for his country. In 1952, I've been to New Zealand, and I play in one week, three different exhibition matches, three different clubs, and each club I play against five in exhibition match. Every day I play against 15 people. They was don't know where is Pakistan, but I was try to they remember Pakistan after that. Hashim was always the consummate gentleman off the court. On the court, uh, uh, gentleman certainly, but one tough competitor. Dignified, uh, charismatic, great player, but a great competitor. He wouldn't give an inch. This was a man who was at a totally different physical level to any player who had actually played competitive squash prior to that and was now setting the standard. Hashim changed squash from a gentleman's game to a professional sport. You know, he, he brought speed, fitness, power to the game, and he was just a, a superior athlete. He was just incredibly hungry, and you saw that on the court. He was very competitive. He wasn't afraid to barrel into people. He wasn't afraid to scrape and, and lunge and dive and, and really wanted to win every point. And people who knew nothing about squash went to see him, you know, and I was one of them. And I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated watching Hashim. Hashim looks like those guys you see in Chicago in the middle of winter that are gonna go in the polar bear club and go plunging into Lake Michigan. They got a big pot belly, you know, short legs, bald head. Hashim Khan looked a lot like Pablo Picasso, or even like Yul Brenner from The King and I, the sort of, you know, aging, very wise person. And he didn't look like a real fit young squash player. I thought, well, if I can't beat this little black, I'll give it up. He's like he's four foot nothing, or whatever he is. I, he's under five, he's about five foot. And, uh, <laughs> I soon got a rude awakening when I got onto the court for the first time. I never saw the ball. Nine love, nine love, nine love, he beat me. 
I thought, truth, I don't know anything about this game. He just brought sort of organised chaos to the squash court. He just had you totally disoriented. The ball was coming at all directions, all speeds. He was just so much faster, you couldn't put the ball away. If you dropped the ball at the front of the court and he was at the back of the court, he could get to that ball before it bounced twice, and nobody could do that. But somehow, he was in communication with that squash ball. The only way that, that Hashim wasn't going to get the ball back is if his opponent put it in his pocket. His Nick shots were just unbelievable. Nick is when he hits the front wall, and then he hits the side wall and the floor, and the ball will run along the ground. That's the one, right in the creek. And it doesn't bounce, so you can't get the ball back. This feathery drop shot, that he would go up there and he'd tweak the ball, like that feathery drop shot that would kind of hit the front wall and then it's gonna die. Even if you got a shot back, it's the next one that was gonna go down your throat. Yeah, we can play last one for the World Championship, another one. I want to win. And he went on to win the British Open uh, seven times. The first time I go back to Pakistan and I told my uh, Air Force boss, uh, I'm too old already for British Open my age and uh, I like to keep the championship in Pakistan. Well, I was playing tennis before that actually. And uh, when Hashem, my brother, won the championship, he came back. He said, uh, you better start taking up squash because we wanted to keep the trophy in the family. So I said, all right, I tried to play first. First day, I couldn't finish one game. I was having so much pain all in my legs and all around. And after one game, he said, I can't play anymore. I said, yes, all right, take time. And another day, two game, Another day, three game, like that, two hour every day. And as I've said, those were the most painful months of his life because he had to go on court with his ogre of a brother um, and do these two hour sessions, day after day after day after day after day, where, you know, he was run ragged and run ragged and run ragged and run ragged. But he said, well, if you wanted to be champion, you have to keep it up. <laughs> so I keep on trying, trying, and then in the end, it was getting better daily and every week, every month, and so on. After eight months, he go with me to London for British Open. And when I came here first year, that was uh, in December 1952. Ever since, you know, I never lost to anybody in every time I play in the final with the Hashem. Then. It tells a story. You know, that somebody could come off a tennis court and be put through this over a period of however many months it was, and then at the end of it, he's number two player in the world. And there were some bloody good players around. When I was a kid, I heard a lot about Hashem, and I remember Hadai Jahan, Hidi Jahan, who is in England. We used to play together. So I say, I'm Hashem Khan, and he say, oh, well, I'm Hashem Khan. We used, sometime we used to argue. And okay, today I'm Hashem Khan, today, tomorrow you become Hashem Khan, and I will become Azam Khan, you know. And the two brothers dominated quite easily. Then their cousin Roshan joined them. And that was the uh, Khan legacy on the game, which continued for about 13 or 14 years. So this became like the three musketeers, then it became the four musketeers, <laughs> because Mohibullah Sr. joined the group. Yeah, for the Khan dynasty, is rather like JFK, to Kennedy dynasty in America, or in fact our own royal family, Hashem basically became the king of squash. Once he started the winning of British Open straight away, so the way was open for everybody. It was way for us, and we went on his steps then. Well, within the squash circle, the culture was totally different. They would have been going to clubs that were very privileged clubs, very restricted membership. The Khans could definitely play in those clubs, but they wouldn't have been able to join them. Having said that, within a very short period of time, because of what they did on the court, there was total respect for their ability. One thing about Hashem Khan in the Khan dynasty is that 
It always seemed like Hashem would win. He was the elder statesman. He was the oldest brother. He was the father. And sometimes you wondered whether the matches were meant to go that way. And out of sheer respect, as an elder, they wouldn't, they wouldn't dare beat him even if they could. You know? And I'm sure Azam could have beaten, beaten him about three or four times at yes. least, you know, yeah. but didn't dare. Well, that's our theory. And if you talk to Azam, all they do is smile at you. So yeah. they'll never admit that they fixed all the games. That is a possibility. If sometime, if he got a, time, got a chance to beat me, he never try. Oldest brother and teacher. <laughs> Rumour has it that um, Roshan would perhaps be one of the great players in due course, but Hashem would be a winner for a few more years, Azim would be a winner for a few years, and then Roshan would be a f winner for a few years. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. But it transpired that Roshan beat Hashem in a semi-final. I think Hashem's um, worst result was losing to Roshan when he had the bad leg. I used to beat him all the time, but after one or two games, he started cramping my leg right here. You know, these cramps, we all get it in the playing, and you feel like you got tons of something on your feet. You can't lift the feet up. In the last three games against Roshan. And sometimes Roshan, he run over on him and push him, because that's what the reason he beat Hashem. So I said, you don't have to do that. Don't have to push him, you know, that's uh, not right. And in the final, Azam Khan played Roshan. And I happened to see that match, and I don't know, I think it was probably a bit of misfortune, a bit of bad luck, but Azam did take his racket back and did catch Roshan in the teeth. I never feel I hit him, and because he's always do that over your shoulder. So he bound to get hit, and I heard tack, tack, his teeth drop. So when I looked behind, he was doing this. And I looked at him, what happened? Oh. <laughs> and he lost all his teeth. And all I remember is um, Roshan going pff, pff, pff. Click, 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 click. So they took him to hospital, and I was two one up. And I'm stinging the court. People, oh, he hit him, and you, you know. And then I just feel don't like to, to, to win that match. So he, he, they came back the next day. <laughs> and finished the game. He said the, the first prize was 50 pounds or whatever it was. He said that would cost him more than that to get his mouth fixed. And Roshan beat him. He, uh, and Asim said, I had to let him win for the, to get his mouth fixed. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, there are different stories about that. Some say that it was um, by mistake. Some say it was hit on purpose. But uh, whatever it was, my father showed him a ball and he said, Roshan, can you see the ball? He said, yes. He said, then, there is no excuse, you're a Pathan. You go on the court, <laughs> right? So he went on the court again. He was too love up, he lost next two games, and he won the fifth game. So I think this is a fantastic example for willpower. That was the ability that lay within the family. The genetic ability was fantastic in terms of the physicality and also the intuitiveness to sense how to play the game and what to do with the talents that they had on the court. There's an air of wonderment, really, about these Pakistanis who appeared from a, a relatively small area and were incredibly good at the game. I have seen British people coming, checking water in Peshawar. They say there's something to do with water. These brothers are playing the game. That I have witnessed myself. He used to play semi-final in family, every championship in the world. Myself, my brother Azam, senior Mahabola, Roshan. English people don't like that and change the ball for that reason. Hashim tells a story about how one year the British Association changed the ball as a way perhaps to prevent the, the Khan family members from, from reaching the semis of, of a tournament. And that might be true. I think they probably did experience a, a undercurrent of, of prejudice uh, that the, the, these Pakistanis were coming and, and winning their tournaments year after year. The Pakistanis, once they got hold of the game, they became almost invincible. And, you know, obviously in the 50s, you, know, you had Hashem and Azam dominating, you had Moe Bulakan, had Roshan, 
I come as a man, won one of those British Opens, and then Jahangir, he won 10, and I think Jancha went on to win probably six or, so, or thereabouts. After Hashim Khan came like uh, a, a dozen or so players from Pakistan, which are each one a legend in himself, so if he wasn't there and uh, made that, uh, such a big impact, I don't think squash uh, for, in terms of Pakistan would have grown and we wouldn't have seen champions. Uh, like there wouldn't be a Jahangir or a Jancher. Without them, squash wouldn't be where it is right now. The Khans knew above all the psychology of the game in a sport which after all wasn't necessarily as hard as many of the aspects of life from where they'd come. But they certainly knew how to uh, twist the knife when it came to playing competition. And add, add that, the exceptional skill they had, there's no way that they, they could probably get beaten when you think about it. Because too many Khan, you beat one, the other one come and beat you. <laughs> so you can't beat all the Khan family, you know. And within a relatively short period of time, all of them won with the American hardball, which is a different game. It's not as different necessarily as cricket and baseball, but it is a different game. When I come to United States, there was a different game. That time the ball was too tough ball, like golf ball. Go too fast, I would think I make big mistake. I can't control that ball. He's playing a different game of squash. It's different rules, the ball's different, the racket's heavier, and the court is smaller. The first US Open, obviously, was the first time that amateurs played against the professionals. The event was all really hyped up. They had well attended, the galleries were full for every match. And nobody knows what to expect from Hashim because in the last three years, he's never lost a match. He's also, in 1954, 40 years old, well past his prime. He's playing these 23-year-olds, these young, fit players. And uh, he kind of makes his way through the tournament in the semifinals, he plays Deal Matera, the number one player from Marion Cricket Club. Deal's this huge, strong, burly man, hits the hell out of the ball. And Hashem, you know, bewildered by uh, Deal serving, by all his shots, barely gets through the match, really struggling, but he wins the match. So he gets into the finals, and he's playing Henry Salon. He was one of the great American players, French-American players now. And as you could see through the tournament, Hashim was slowly picking up this American version of squash, slowly learning the tricks and, and improving. But in the finals, he ran out of time. I thought I was pretty much in control after a few points, which I was, really. The first two games, you know, the, I think it was 15-8, 15-12. And the third game, he caught up with me at 14 all. And I remember that point very well. <laughs> I, I just hit a drop shot that just just nicked on the floor. I caught it right into the crease of the sidewall. And it just, no chance to pick it up, nothing. The match was over. And Henry admitted to me a couple years later that if he had lost that last point, he had no more gas in the tank play any more games. The interesting thing was Hashim Khan didn't win the first US Open, but because of his personality, because he was Hashim Khan, that week Life Magazine, the biggest selling magazine in the country, did a huge spread on the event on Hashim Khan. Yeah, of course, they, they thought he was gonna win no matter what. So unfortunately, I, I sort of messed that up. And they had about seven or eight pages on that. And at the bottom of page eight, it said, oh, by the way, he lost to Henry Salon in the finals. That was fun. fun. When I play first time, I was like the game. And therefore, I was thinking I retired from British game in that US Open. That is the easy, small court is will come to you and easy to play. I can play another 25, 30 years. Even though Hashim had a, a great lifestyle in Pakistan and he had this nice job, he had a large family and he, he wanted to take care of them. And America was really the land of opportunity for him. 
Detroit in the 1960s was Motown, it was the Motor City, it was an exciting place to be. The American dream it always included having a car, and this was really an up-and-coming city, and he could really capitalize on that. You know, that fella, Arthur B. Sennibon, he's the one to give me the job in Detroit. He was the club secretary. <laughs> He's the one to bring me here to the United States and give me the job. I really didn't really know or hear about Hashem until the late 50s when uh, Art Sonneborn, a local entrepreneur, uh, brought him over from Pakistan and paid his way over here and came right to our club as a teaching pro. When I come first, I really don't like it. On the first day, I walked from the apartment building to the club. It was two feet snow. <laughs> and uh, I was not used to do that in Pakistan, 10 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock. I used to go to officer mess one or two hour afternoon, or, or sometime if I don't like to go, he's, no, he's all right. <laughs> Hashem Khan becomes the professional at a very small public club in Detroit. And it's such a small club that it doesn't have its own pro shop. So you walk into the club and you're in the locker room and there's Hashem Khan, the world's greatest player ever, stringing rackets by hand, sitting on a bench in the locker room. But he had a way of stringing rackets by hand and he would put that racket there in between his leg and he did it and when he got through with it, He'd take that racket and he'd hit it up, and he could hear a certain tone, a string. tone to that. And it was, just, and it wasn't right. He'd put it down there, tighten it up again. He, yeah, that that sounds right now. He says, "Okay." He says, He's "Got a good racket now, it's like a piano tuner." There was a newspaper. Hashem left Pakistan. He's gone to the United States. In the Pakistan president, he was very unhappy. But he told the education minister to write letter to Hashem, anything you want, come back. And I told him, I got a big family. If you give me about 200 acre land, then they'll come. And the education minister decide we give you 64 acre. And uh, I'll take 64 acre land but I sold it, and I had to go. <laughs> uh, Ashim, did you like it here? Did you like it, the club? Oh, the wonderful people there. I miss really all the members. We had a barber there. Right, Tony. barber uh, Tony. One time I told him, I'm not really sorry to pay for my haircut. And he said, you should pay more. I said, why? It's my job to cut the hair, isn't it? I can't find the hair. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, the community just welcomed him marvelously. And again, times are different now. And he was, he, he was a breath of fresh cultural air. We used to go downtown and listen to Middle Eastern music and eat curry food. And with this curry food, I'd always have a beer or something. And, and I said, Hashim, you gonna have a beer? He said, oh, no, no, you don't touch alcohol. No, we never saw him touch never, alcohol. Never touch We're alcohol or anything like that, but he could sure love that hot curry food. He eats only halal. Halal is Muslim for kosher. Actually, they, when he came, they used to buy their food in Jewish butcher shops because they were killed according to oil or vice versa. Hashim Khan came from an extremely different background, totally different from the Ivy League, white bread, uh, preppy squash world that, that I knew so well in the early years of my collegiate and am amateur game. These clubs, they weren't used to non-white people coming to their door to say, I want to play squash. And in fact, more than once, he was directed around to the service entrance of squash clubs because the porters at the front had never seen a man with his skin color coming, to, coming into the club. But he has this uncanny ability to relate with people, no matter what station of life those people might be. And he was quite comfortable with the people when he came to America. Well, good luck. Good luck, champ. Thanks, Ashley. He was a gentleman. He was a good teacher. Couldn't understand him too well because of his broken English. But 
if you wanted to understand him, you could, because most of the conversation was about step here, step there, come on up, come on back. So you understood all of that. No, that is very simple, easy way to hit the same angle, to hit and same angle to finish, like you got a hammer. Even though he came from a completely different culture, and even though he didn't speak uh, English properly, everybody immediately gravitated to him. He was so charismatic. You people got any question? You're listed just under Sharif in the program, and it shows here you're only six years older than Sharif is. It has your age listed as 39. I was wondering if you could explain that secret to us. Well, tomorrow he will be here. You can tell. He's look like older than me six years. <laughs> he could talk to you about the game. He could, he could talk about life. And people immediately said, this guy is something else. We want to watch him play. We want to talk to him in the locker room. We want him to come to our cocktail parties. And so these private clubs that didn't have non-white members, that didn't have Muslim members, were suddenly opening their arms up to Hashim Khan from Pasharwa. Your caption here is never too old for squash. Maybe right, maybe wrong, <laughs> there for a reason. When you're getting old, you, you can't play squash like you used to. But you, you've still won tournaments uh, at this age, b back then. I mean, he still had, a still had a couple more to put under his belt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got uh, some uh, cold vintage in England, 55 over. I win that six times <laughs> in 75 year age. <laughs> wow. Playing with guys tw 20 years younger. He plays in the 75 and older category. He, of course, wants them to have a 90 uh, year old and older category so he can win it easily. I haven't played squash for a good 10 years. That's wonderful, you know. If he's 13 years older than I, I'll be 79 in a month. That makes him 92. To still be playing squash is just one remarkable feat. Yeah, that is a squash magazine. It's a big two, three pages article in the squash magazine. <laughs> On behalf of your whole family, we wish you a very happy 90th Thank birthday. You. Thank you. Thank you. This is his 90th birthday, officially. But as to the actual date that he was born, uh, it's still um, debatable. I thought he was 90 tonight, but we're not really sure. Nobody really knows how old he is. 92, 90, 91. I assume that he's in his mid-90s. I'm thinking 95, 96 is what I'm guessing. I think that's enough. I think 94, too. But we he think. When he gets to be 100, I'm going to challenge him again. <laughs> We're here to celebrate Dad's birthday. Yeah. Just about all of us came out here, for the exception of Aziz and my sister in Pakistan. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Genius. My drop shot. Hey, you'll be a little drop shot, a little <laughs> overlap, over head. And if you notice, excellent driving. At this age, you know, most people you know, are usually very hesitant, and his driving is excellent, and he's a, a cautious driver. He doesn't speed. I speed in the ticket. I guess they do say so much to you. Do so a dollar me work. Twenty-five miles an hour. Our ma Rawan on forty-two. Okay, we'll take that praise back. He said he got a speeding ticket a couple of months ago in his neighborhood. It's twenty-five mile zone, and he was doing forty. I got seven boys, and they all they like to play squash like me. The one thing that Dad was always available for was to play squash, and that was that was a great common ground, you know, where we could just meet and go at it. The patriarch of the Khan family. And why is he smiling? Because he's defeating his 34-year-old son, Sharif Khan. This should be it. There it is. I've seen win 15-12. You don't even look tired. No, not really, no. How long have you been playing squash? 55 years. And how many of your sons and members of your family play? Well, he's my fourth son is a professional already. Two, my nephew. Uh, I kind of count all my cousins. 
my brother and all the family is still playing. We'll be bringing you what has developed into an all Khan final match between brothers Aziz and Sharif Khan. Both finalists are sons of the greatest squash player in the history of the game, Hashim Khan. That's a great get. Did you see that? One oh, by Aziz and one by Sharif. Quickness of the shots. Boom, boom, boom. It's Good athletes. Great athletes. That is Sharif. When he was very My young. My son come with me to London for boarding school. And he don't like to go to London, but no choice. There was good school in all Europe, and he was got scholarship. The headmaster of the school had offered me uh, a sports scholarship, sight unseen. Uh, he just had my father's Hashim's word to go by. And I was there for almost nine years. As far as my father, I barely saw him when I was at school. I may have seen him a dozen times for, for two decades. 32-year-old Sharif Khan won the World Squash Championship again last January in Philadelphia. He has won the title eight of the last nine years and has virtually dominated North American competition for over a decade. Sharif, he was so much fun to watch because he was so deceptive and he was so fun because his eyes would, you know, you could see more of the white in his eyes and he'd, he'd look at his opponent just before he hits the shot and then he'd, you know, fake you out and uh, he was fun to watch. I remember one day, uh, that he turned around with a froth on his mouth and his eyes bulging out. And there was a little kid in the gallery start crying, looking at him. <laughs> so there is some fearness. There never seemed to be an occasion when somebody wouldn't come into the changing room and start talking about his father. Sharif, who obviously loves his dad and is, loves his dad's reputation, you know, he'd just say to me, oh my God, wouldn't it be great if one day somebody said to me, gee, I think you're better than your dad. <laughs> but he said, it's never going to happen, is it? And I said, no way, son, never going to happen. There's not too many times where father and son compete at a high level against each other, but it happened to me in 1970 when my father was somewhere in his mid-50s or even 60, who knows. But every point was, it seemed to have lasted for hours. One minute I'm saying, he's just another opponent. I've got to beat him. And the next minute I'm saying, my God, I'm playing against my father, I'm playing against an icon, I'm playing against a, a legend. Mm, sorry. <laughs> I beat him in four games. Sorry, Dad. But the point I'm trying to make is that the man had so much class, he came across the court, and usually, you know, perfunctory shake hands and, you know, you know, big hug for me, big bear hug for me. He had given me his blessing. It was very noticeable whenever we entered a tournament or what have you that, oh, yeah. you know, you're one of the convoys or you're one of the... And it was naturally guys. assumed that we were... <laughs> gonna win it. <laughs> we were, Which was well, a big assumption. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Yeah, there were rivalries with, you know, especially in the sports aspect of it, carried over to the personal life too, especially between my siblings. You know, you can see that, that's still there. You know, they still talk uh, trash when, when they're at home. In fact, they were doing that this morning. They win the first game of the day. We're not talking had, about they it. They were celebrating their victory right off the it's bat. It's a very sensitive subject. Yeah. <laughs> but we want a rematch anyhow, in any event. <laughs> You'll have to talk to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was definitely the one that held it all together for us, and the glue, you know, the, the two different worlds colliding, and she was definitely the one that kept it all together. And she's very, very influential as far as learning the culture of the Muslim way. Yeah, when I used to drive him home, I says, Hashim, can I go? He says, oh, no, you can't come in the house. Wife cannot uh, see other men. She wouldn't let me see her. Yeah, they called well. me up. She was very sick one Saturday night. So I got in the car, and I, I, I'm old fat. I made house calls, lots of them, and I went to see her. But I had to examine her back to back. I couldn't examine her face forward. And incidentally, they showed me where her pain was on a doll, and uh, that's how I had to work. She wonderful religion ladies, and she wonderful mother. And she wonderful wife, very good. Eventually, we ended up having 12 kids. I have two kids. That's killing me. 
<laughs> Can you imagine 12? I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't know how she did it. Whenever we had a birthday in the family, we would always have the same cake. Dad would get, he loves coconut cake, white frosted coconut cake. So whoever's birthday it was, we would have a white frosted coconut cake. And there were two gifts that the boys would get. Uh, one of them was a copy of his book, Squash Rackets, the kind of story. And the other one was a pair of Converse shoes. So uh, it was, it was kind of cool. And for the girls growing up in a culture where the woman's supposed to be respectful for the husband and do the cooking and taking care of the kids, you know, yeah, yeah, it was tough for them. You know, try to grow up in you know, a dual society, so to speak, because it was really that, that's what it was. Although dad was a great dad, he was traveling a lot. And mom was a great lady. She stayed home and took care of us. She took care of all the kids. And she doesn't speak English, so we had to help her a lot. She don't mind. I go for three months in Europe, three months in Australia, New Zealand. She says, that is your job. You like to do that, carry on. But one thing, I was not pray regular like used to. But she said, now, you're going to pray five times a day. Don't <laughs> And she was make me start. Islam say, Believe the God. God say you can pray and you can uh, keep fasting. You can help poor, poor people. Be nice to everybody. Don't hurt anybody. Help everybody if you can. That is all good thing they say. Therefore, we believe is the best. And I know, because I have a close link with him. He has helped many people. He has helped many uh, patterns in their education. Mr. Hashim built a veranda inside the mosque a few years back. The feeling, the feeling. He built it at that time. It's still there. <laughs> people of this community reached to him and said, we need some more money for the mosque, electric transformer is blow out, so they need another new transformer. So Hashem is going to help them one too right now, because that's why you can go to that room. There is dark, there is no electricity right now. He, by his example, has shown that a man of deep religious faith, the man who still sticks to his ethnic traditions, can still be a man who could be in the modern world. and. That sort of negates the stereotypical view that religion and modernity cannot uh, live together, cannot be accommodated. I was raised a Muslim. Uh, I was raised a Patan. That's the tribe we're from. You, know, you hear all these stories and you see all these things and the way the world reacts to stereotypes. And you know, it's not true. You know, not everybody thinks like that. I think to kill innocent people, uh, that is wrong, against religion, I think. But uh, they just follow Imam. They listen to all these uh, religion people. I think a lot of people don't understand the figure for Muslim, or for Pakistani, we have to be bad people. They just have that set in their mind that this is what we believe also, which is complete opposite. I mean, we're about as American as you can get. In 1973, he decided to move to Denver. His wife was ill, and he wanted her to live in an environment that was better for her respiratory illness, and also because Denver reminded him of Basharwa, the sort of snow-capped mountains in the distance. I prevailed upon him to come to Denver and uh, look over our club and see whether he was interested in coming out here. And he has since been a very, very great asset to our squash program at the Denver Athletic Club. When we dedicated this room, we invited all of Hashim's family, his daughters and his sons. They came in from around the country, and they were just amazed of all the trophies he had that they have never seen. I win the British Open. I win the British Open. British Open. British Open. British Open. British Open. British Open. Seven times. As yeah. famous as he is, as many tournaments as he's won and titles, I've only seen him that one time is when he was retiring 
and that was the day that he played first. And I sat with mom, and I think that was the first time she had gone too. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just the way it is in our country. You stay home, take care of the family, and let the men take care of whatever they need to take care of. Hello. Hi. Hi. I think they would have all preferred that we got married the traditional way. But quite honestly, they've, they've accepted us, and they've accepted our families, um, our kids, our wives. We tried to explain to him that being raised in the Western countries, you go by the Western cultures. And my parents have gradually came around to that. Well, I started playing squash 13. And Hashim really didn't know I was playing at that time until I was on the cover of a magazine and the first female con really to be playing in the United States. And he called and said, what is she doing? My dad said, you know, she's not doing anything wrong. And then Hashim goes, well, she is winning. So it was, it was so typical. And he encouraged me right after that. I had never seen him play until today. I just like saw a whole new side of him. And I don't play squash, but it still felt like it was a significant thing that I was actually playing with the con. And he's my grandpa. That's beauty. Thank you. That's gorgeous. Athleticism has always kind of run through our family. If I'm able to achieve a half of a quarter of what he's been able to accomplish, then I'm satisfied. <laughs> Spending more time in America made him realize that you know women should be out there, because. For them, there was no education in Peshawar, but with me and Shahina, he wanted us to go to medical school. <laughs> so it was totally opposite. Hashim Khan has been awarded with Sitare Imtiaz, the star of distinction. Pakistan does not have many awards that it confers on people, but Sitare Imtiaz is the highest honor anyone can be given for achievements in any sphere of life. Pakistan is acknowledging Hashim Khan's contribution towards putting Pakistan on the global map. Mr. Hashim Khan has won seven British Opens, three US Opens, three Canadian Opens, an Australian Open, eight Scottish Opens, five British professionals, and three US professionals. The Islamic Republic of Pakistan is pleased to confer on Mr. Hashim Khan the award of Sitare Imtiaz. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I probably wouldn't be playing squash if it wasn't for you. So I've got to thank you, I suppose, because I love the game, I love playing the game, and in a way, you've given me the opportunity to do this. So what an example for us to follow. And we tried to follow, and, and as a result, the Khans have been uh, competing, touring, teaching, uh, you know, competing at squash worldwide for the last 50 years as a result of Hashim's efforts. The squash has given me my life, changed my life. He was, to my mind, the ultimate competitor. He picked up the racket and the ball, and the more he hit, the more thirsty he came. His whole family today has changed because of him. Turned the destiny of the whole family because he kept himself thirsty. Hello, hello, how are you? I am good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see so you. So nice to see you. I am very lucky to go, still get good health in my age. To still people treat me very well. Are you still playing? No, how about you? 
I just fool around in double court, uh -huh. not run. <laughs> I, I choose partner, he's run for me. I see. I, I understand. I can't get anyone to run for me. <laughs> who would ever thought, like, a boy who played barefoot as a ball boy would make it this far? That's really amazing to me. Mr. Barty, Mrs. Barty, everybody, thank you. And you know something about Hashem? If we're walking somewhere together and we get to an entrance, do you think for one minute that he would go ahead of me? No, I have to go ahead of him. He opens the door for me, and it's just a genteel step that I'm impressed with. Oh, I'll follow you. And I'll follow you. Right, we go together. All right, that's good. And I think what keeps him going to the squash club every other day is the game of squash. I like the game. Just, <laughs> just like the game. Same place. Come on, Hash. Sorry. Come to same place. 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 That look easy, but it's not easy if you not hit that ball right.